Good morning, everyone. As we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. We are, of course, reminded that's what we're doing in our, you know, our big church approach. Looking at Jesus this year, we look at Jesus every year, but in a particular focused way this year. And one of the ways we've invited you to do that is to read through the book of Mark. I know 25 of you have done that beginning to end uh, and have come and told me about it. So if you've done that as well and haven't told me yet, I'd love to hear and hear about uh, what your experience has been as you've encountered Jesus in that. Uh, And if you haven't done that yet, let me encourage you to do so. Read through Mark from start to finish. Doesn't have to be all in one sitting. That's all right. And, um, you know, maybe you're not a reader. I've spoken to someone who uh, downloaded like a sound clip of someone reading through Mark and they listened through Mark. That's just as valid, you know, for ticking it off. Um, But more importantly, that's a great way to hear hear the words of the Lord. We're going to hear the words of the Lord, but in Luke today, and Seb's going to bring that to us now. So why don't I pray as he comes up? We do indeed, Father, pray that uh, as you speak, the things around would grow dim. Help us to listen in awe to your voice and uh, to know it and to love you as a result and to do it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, we'll be reading from Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 50. If you'd like to read along, that we can do that. <laughs> when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman that ta- in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eat- eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came to him th- and with an alabaster jar of perfume, As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. To people who owed money to a certain money lender, one owed him 500 denarii, and the other owed 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with my hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my feet, head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? Then Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Mm. Nikki Cruz was leader of the Mau Mau's, the toughest gang in New York City. Deeply scarred by abusive parents, his refuge from all that was to run with the gangs and to lash out against others. I was high on hate and violence, he recalls. I wanted to do to others what my mother did to me. I used to feel good when I hurt some people. One day, a country pastor named David Wilkerson showed up in New York. The city was completely foreign to him. All he knew was he had a desire to tell young people that God loved them. Nikki tells the story of what happened when they met like this. I heard his voice. God has the power to change your life. I started cursing loud. I spit in his face and I hit him. I told him, I don't believe in what you say. Get out of here. Wilkerson replied, you could cut me up into a thousand pieces and lay them out on the street and every one of them would still love you. 
And Nikki recalled it did damage, good damage in my brain and in my heart. I began to question, and for two weeks I could not sleep thinking about love. Nikki and his gang showed up at one of this pastor's rallies. One by one, they gave their lives to Christ. It was the crucifixion, Jesus' death on the cross, that grabbed Nikki. I was choked up with pain. My eyes were fighting and tears began to come down and more tears and I was fighting. And then I surrendered, says Nikki. I let Jesus hug me and I let my head rest on his chest. I said, I'm sorry, forgive me. And for the first time, I told someone, I love you. For this young man, this gang leader, forgiveness transformed his life. He heard of the love and grace of God, and only then was he able to know what it was to love anyone else. And in our reading this morning, uh, we just heard another story of forgiveness and love coming together. And what a story it is. This Pharisee, Simon, invites Jesus to his house. He's kind of interested in who Jesus is, so he invites him along to dinner, and partway through the dinner, a woman gate crashes the party. She almost gate crashes Luke's storytelling, actually. He literally writes, and Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and was reclining at the table, and look, a woman who was from the city, a sinner. It's almost like, you know, decades later, as Luke writes it all down, he's surprised to see her there. And in she comes, and she cries on Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair and pours perfume on them. The part of this story I find particularly fascinating is she uses her hair to wipe Jesus' feet. Partly, I think that's weird because I just think hair would be the worst substitute for a chucks cloth ever. Like, (laughs) really? But also, hair is so personal. Hair's almost an expression of our personality. Take a look at these images. From this guy's haircut, I can tell that he loves coffee as much as anyone at the coffee baron. (laughs) that he rides a bike to work and he probably listens to bands that I've never heard of. Now I can tell all that from his haircut. What about this lady? Modern, sophisticated, classy. You can tell it from her hair. Hair's like this, you know, personality thing. I don't know my subcultures well enough to know exactly what she's saying, but she's definitely saying something with her haircut. And this woman in our story, she takes her hair and wipes Jesus' feet. Hair's very personal, not just in terms of kind of our identity, but in terms of kind of intimacy and relationship. You think about the parent-child bonding as a father or a mother braids their little girl's hair. Or the caress of husband and wife on their hair. I love to touch Rochelle's hair, except on washing day. I'm not allowed to do that. It's intimate and personal. That's what we see in this story. This woman kind of shows this deep, personal, intimate, loving connection with Jesus. And there's a contrast here between the Pharisee and the woman. They've both expressed some kindness, some kindness towards Jesus. Simon invites Jesus to dinner, hospitality. The woman gives him So much more, though, the perfume, the tears, even symbolically herself. As opposed to Simon, who just kind of has fulfilled the bare minimum as host. Here's the food. Here's the invitation. Come on in. What a contrast. What differences in how they loved Jesus. That's what happens. But what does Jesus say as he reflects on this scene? What does he say in the midst of this moment? Well, he makes this fascinating connection between love and forgiveness. He says that the woman loves him, and so she's been forgiven. But here's the question. Did love earn the forgiveness, or does the love flow from forgiveness? Which causes which? We heard from Nicky Cruz in his story, it was forgiveness that changed his heart so that he was able to say, I love you to Jesus and then in time to others, forgiveness and then love. And yet in this story, it almost looks like 
the other way around. The woman loves Jesus, and at the end he says, you're forgiven. Love first. And as you read it carefully, well, verse 47 seems to go both ways. The NIV's kind of smoothed it out, but most translations say, her sins have been forgiven for she loved much. Love first and therefore forgiveness. And then yet in the second half of that very same verse, it says, he who has been forgiven little loves little. Forgiveness first and then love. Which way around is it? I ask this not just to raise an intellectual query. I'm not kind of playing the religious version of which came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, No, it's an important question because we all need forgiveness. When we come to encounter Jesus as we're seeking to do, well, none of us can say we're perfect. Far from it, in fact. We might be able to fool others that we're pretty good, but as you read this story, you know, Jesus sees what's going on. Simon and he have this little conversation about what they're seeing. Jesus sees right to the heart of the woman and into Simon's heart. Even the secret conversation he has in his own mind as he watches the scene unfold, Jesus sees all of that. And none of us could look Jesus in the face knowing our secret inward thoughts and claim perfection. So often we seek our own best at the expense of others, so often we say to God, just can you leave me alone for a few minutes so I can do what I want, or you know, a few months or a few years? That makes us sinners. People who are in wrong standing with God, which means we need forgiveness. And if we're sinners and we need forgiveness, how do we get it? Does this story say, well, just if you perform one extraordinary act of love, then you'll be forgiven. Is that what Luke's trying to tell us? Well, lots of people would certainly agree that that's the case. Most people, in fact, think that forgiveness works like that in general. Let me demonstrate. When you go to the newsagent um, and you're standing there with all the cards in front of you and you know the funny spinny things which have all the cards on them, what are the categories of cards you can buy? Birthday cards, wedding and anniversary cards, thank you cards, get better soon cards, goodbye cards, but there are no sorry cards at the newsagent. Have you ever noticed that? There are no sorry cards at the newsagent, but there are sorry cards at the florist. (laughs) You can say sorry if you buy flowers too. There's no forgiveness without flowers. There's no forgiveness without saying, I really do love you. You know, remember, and I'm sorry about what happened. Will you forgive me? And then you kind of, you know, here's the relationship, remember? Will you forgive me? Lots of people think about forgiveness that way with God. We could only be forgiven if we remind God that we really do love him deep down, and then maybe he'll forgive us. So... We go to church regularly, we throw ourselves into small groups or go to the wow events or the band or we buy Christian books and we try to remember not to swear and then maybe, maybe God will forgive us. Is that what we've read in Luke today? It's a little unclear, but let's start with what is clear in the story and that's this little story within the story that Jesus tells. There were two debtors. One owed a moneylender 10 grand, $10,000, and another 100 grand. Neither of them could pay him back, so the guy forgave both of them. Crazy. Who's going to love the moneylender more? Well, Simon gives the obvious answer the guy who was forgiven 100 grand. But what came first in that story? Forgiveness. And then from that, love. And that's very good news when we think about our situation with God because the scenario I outlined before, well, it's pretty terrifying, really. The ways we might try to impress God, then they're, they're never going to be satisfactory. Let me tell you about another man who discovered that forgiveness comes first and then love, whose discovery changed the world. His name was Martin Luther. He was a monk 500 years ago, 
In fact, this year we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the almost accidental revolution that he started, the Reformation. Here's what he wrote about his discovery. As a monk, I led an irreproachable life. Perfect. And nevertheless, I felt that I was a sinner before God. My conscience was restless. I could not depend on God being propitiated by my satisfactions. That is, I couldn't be sure that whatever I'd done would ever be enough. Try as he might, Luther could never be sure in his conscience that anything would successfully show God that he really did love him and so win that forgiveness. And this next sentence is incredible because it shows what happens to us when we try and manufacture that love. Luther says, not only did I not love, but I actually hated God, the righteous God who punishes sinners. Luther writes elsewhere that kind of, he thought about God with this high standard and he hated God for it. Why couldn't you have just made the bar a little bit lower? And then I could have proved that I loved you and you would forgive me and we would be okay. And thankfully, God showed him something. As Luther was studying the book of Romans one day, he discovered that forgiveness comes first. God has mercy without us needing to impress him first. He writes, Then finally, God had mercy on me, and I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that gift of God by which a righteous man lives. The merciful God justifies us by faith. Fancy language, but notice that last incredible sentence, the merciful God justifies us by faith. Justifies means make the relationship right. It means dealing with the sin problem. And that means forgiveness comes. Once God has dealt with the sin thing, then the relational barrier between us and him is gone and forgiveness flows. Jesus says pretty much the same thing as that last sentence at the end of our account. Verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He doesn't say your good deeds saved you. He doesn't say, I really see your heart. There's some good in you deep down in there, you know, the tears and the perfume. You've convinced me that you love me enough so I forgive you. He doesn't say that. He says, your faith, your trust in me saved you. Forgiveness first. Not trying to love God until we can convince him to forgive us. When we read carefully, it's so clear here. In fact, it's so clear that many commentators think Jesus had probably met this woman earlier, maybe earlier in the day or a couple of days previously, and they'd had this you know, forgiveness moment, and here she comes to thank him. What does that mean for us? Well, it shapes the whole structure of our relationship with God. We don't have to try and impress God We don't have to work up feelings of love. We heard from poor old Martin Luther what that was like. Many of us could say in ourselves, the cycle of guilt that comes from sin. We sin, we feel bad, so we try and do something about it. But in our trying to do something about it, we sin again, so we feel worse. So we have to work harder, and then we sin worse, or we just give up and sin and sin and sin and just feel so dreadful. And the cycle goes on, a spiral downwards but God breaks through all of that he pours out forgiveness where we didn't deserve it and there is an offer of freedom you don't have to solve your own problems you don't have to save yourself Jesus invites everyone to do as this woman did just trust him to have a special encounter with him where you say I can't save myself I need you Have you had that kind of encounter? If not, the invitation's right here before us, before you today. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to be a little bit more good or a lot more good even before God will accept you. You might feel like the guy who owed $100,000, impossible to pay back God. You might feel like whatever this woman did, it can't have been as bad as what you've done. Jesus says the penalty for sin, any sin, is death. And he's already died. It's all paid. It's all dealt with. He can simply forgive. You don't need to impress him first. You just come. Receive his forgiveness. Just stop 
and ask. Many of us in the room have already had that encounter with Jesus. We've been a Christian for a long time, some of us decades. We've confessed, we've said sorry, we've received his forgiveness. And the point of this passage for us is a reminder that we love him. We naturally love him. It flows out. And today I just want to offer a spiritual checkup. During the week, I was chatting with uh, Ian and Jill in the office, and they were reminiscing about the old style family doctor. When you go to one of these kind of doctors, they don't just ask, oh, you know, what seems to be the problem today and deal with your flu and your, or your infected graves or whatever. They do the routine checkup. And so here it is in the picture, you know, say, ah, and they put you on the scales and they take your blood pressure and ask if you've been exercising. You know, just sure you've got this particular issue, but how's your health going? Well, I'm going to do the same thing today. I'm inviting you to take a spiritual checkup. You might have come to church today with all sorts of needs or questions or desires, but while you're here, let me do a spiritual checkup. And here's my question for it How much do you love Jesus? That's it, really. How much do you love Jesus? And what does it look like? The woman generously gave a precious possession. The jar of perfume was possibly even a family heirloom that had been passed down from generation to generation. And she gave of herself, her tears, her kisses, her hair. It comes from the heart. It's personal. It's expressed in a way that makes sense for her. Jesus contrasts her and Simon because she showed love and he didn't. But notice he doesn't say, come on, Simon, where are the tears? Where's the perfume? He doesn't say, you have to be like this woman to show love. He just says, look, as a host, you could have done a bit better. Like, you could have had someone wash my feet when I came in. You could have given me a kiss of greeting. Simon had an opportunity to show love in a natural way that fit his position as host. So what does loving Jesus look like? For you, what's your natural and personal response? What talents do you have, say, that you're using to honour him? We've seen some of the young people amongst us today and the band as ever, you know, a lovely example of people using their talents to serve Jesus. How might you do that? What about with your resources? Are you using them for Jesus? How do you love Jesus with your house? Strange question to ask, perhaps, but, you know, the youth group are looking for places to hang out every now and then. You could open up your house to them. What about your car? Again, how do you love Jesus with your car? That seems weird. Well, great example of that. The men's shed have kind of uh, are working on one of the cars that one of our older members has stopped driving, and they're going to lend it to Dima and Carolyn while they're here. What do you know? You can love Jesus with a car. What about your car? How do you love Jesus with your Facebook profile? Who are the people in your life who you can show love to as an expression of loving Jesus? This is my question. How much do you love Jesus? Is it working its way out in your life? That's my question. It's the kind of the basis of the spiritual health check. But let me say, this isn't a guilt trip. This isn't how much do you love Jesus? Mm, three out of 10. Work harder, please. I don't want you to hear that. That would completely miss what we've been trying to say to get today and the root cause of where love springs from. Because we just said you don't, it's not about working harder to prove something to God. But if you do this checkup and as you honestly look at your life and feel your love has grown cold, Jesus points us to the cure, the secret to loving him. It's not trying harder. What is it that caused the woman to love Jesus? Forgiveness. And for Nikki Cruz and Martin Luther. And for each of us when we came to the Lord. So if you feel your love has grown cold, turn back to the cross. Remember that you too are a sinner. Jesus told that story. One, you know, one person owed ten thousand dollars, the other one a hundred thousand, but they both owed lots of money. Neither of them could pay it. They both end up loving 
the money lender. No matter who you are, we are, we owe, each of us go, owes God our life. The wages of sin is death. We're all sinners. Jesus has already died. And so just remember that. Remember your helplessness before God's judgment and your freedom in his forgiveness. Jesus died for you. And when you remember that and come back to the cross, when you turn your eyes on Jesus, as we sang, that's the secret to finding that love again. Perhaps there are other things blocking our love for Jesus. I get that. Perhaps you feel, you just in the moment, you feel the ongoing struggle with sin. You just, you feel stuck in guilt and shame. Maybe you feel worthless. No one could love or care you. How could you love Jesus? How could he love you? Well, this is the news of the gospel. Christ has already died. Your sin is already dealt with. Forgiveness is already yours today. Or perhaps you feel God's let you down. He hasn't answered your prayers, maybe. Or perhaps, you know, once you could almost feel God was in the room and that sense isn't there, how can you love God anymore? Perhaps you're just too busy, too stressed, too tired, too much in pain, too weak. I don't want to trivialize these things. They each need dealing with in their own way. But I want to say that underneath all of that, more fundamental than any of those things is the fact that Jesus has forgiven our sin, saved our life from death and hell, brought us into his father's family, restored relationship between God and us. Remember that. Remember your forgiveness. And as you do, thankfulness and love will surely grow again. Those other things, they can be dealt with too. And we trust that amongst us as we gather here at Enfield, we've got ways for you to do that. But the foundation underneath it all is remembering the first and constant thing in the Christian life. God forgives you in Jesus Christ, even while we were enemies, that we might then turn and love him in return. I'm going to take a moment to do what we often forget to do as we pray, just to tell Jesus that we love him. We often sing it, but sometimes in our rush to pray, we, forgot, we forget to actually say it. So let's do that together now. Dearest Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the love you showed to this woman, seeing her sin and forgiving her, teaching us that the love flows from that. We thank you that you saw us in sin and you died for us. And grant forgiveness to all who trust you. Jesus, we thank you so much. We pray that uh, the love we have for you would flow out in our lives in very practical ways, in our thoughts and our words and our deeds. For those of us who feel there's something blocking that love, help us remember your forgiveness. Help us deal with those other things. We pray these things, Jesus, but most of all, we want to say, we love you. Amen.